is 7.31 p.m. It is Tuesday, July 25th, 2023. Good evening. My name is Christian Klein, and I am the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals, and I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. Okay. I would like to confirm that all members and anticipated officials are present. Um, Roger DuPont? Here. Patrick Hanlon? Here. Patrick, do you need uh, access to record? I Well, I do, actually. I was ready to forget that again, but you often, yep, I do still need it. Okay. I send request. All right, so now we're set. Okay. Um, and going down the list, uh, Venkat Holly? Yes, here. Sorry. Uh, Dan Riccadelli? Here. And Adam LeBlanc? Here. Um, and Ms. Hoffman is not with us this evening. She uh, is um, way on personal leave. Uh, town officials here assisting us. Um, our board's administrator, Colleen Ralston. Good evening. Good evening, Colleen. Um, appearing for 14 Oakland Avenue, uh, Robert Anessi. I am here. Bob, good to see you. And appearing for 18 Robin Hood Road, uh, Joseph and Caroline Aluya. Here. And Wonderful. Here. This open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely, consistent with an act making appropriations for the fiscal year 2023 to provide for supplementing certain existing appropriations and for certain other activities and projects signed into law on March 29, 2023. This act includes an extension until March 31st, 2025 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Public bodies may continue meet holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the public body physically present at a meeting location, so long as they provide adequate alternative access to remote meetings. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom application with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference. Others are participating by computer audio or by telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name, or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording, and we ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. But as chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. As the board will be taking up new business at this meeting, as chair, I make the following land acknowledgement. Whereas the Zoning Board of Appeals for the Town of Arlington, Massachusetts, discusses and arbitrates the use of land in Arlington, formerly known as monotony, an Algonquin word meaning swift waters, the board hereby acknowledges the Town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts territories today. So this evening, I apologize. I have a conflict um, with a, a work. Uh, I need to be on a different Z Zoom call for a different Zoning Board of Appeals uh, starting at 8.15. Um, so we're going to take items out of order. Um, we will do the administrative items at the very end, um, but we're going to start with uh, docket 375718 Robin Hood Road. Um, and then move on to Oakland Avenue after that, because I am not um, eligible to vote on Oakland Avenue. Uh, so with that in mind, if I could have the applicants for uh, 18 Robin Hood Road um, introduce themselves and let us know what they would like to do. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Joe Aluya. I'm here with my, life, uh, my wife, Caroline. We live, as you mentioned, at 18 Robin Hood Road. Um, and we have a, 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 a garage with an unfinished uh, second floor. The garage was built in uh, 2021. And we'd like to convert the unfinished uh, 
second floor of the garage into an ADU. Okay. Um, would you like me to go ahead and share the drawings that you submitted? Sure. That'd be great. Do that. Um, so this is the elevation, uh, the, the drawings of the garage. I, I would note that the garage does not stand proud of the ground. The ground level plane is not shown in this drawing. Yeah, um, I, I did submit some actual pictures of the garage. Um, in I think in a Word doc, there is, uh, there's two pictures of the garage that I, I submitted. If not, I can certainly share it on my, on my screen, but the garage okay. is built. Um, you're right. It, it is, you know, that's the foundation. This is the the architectural drawing, so to speak, of the garage. The the door is certainly flush with the ground. Uh, and then, so this is the first floor of the garage, uh, and yes, with the stair that leads up to the the upper floor. Is the lower floor going to remain a garage? Yeah. Yep. Um, oops, sorry for the wrong direction. Whoops. Uh, this is the upper floor level. Um, so the top of the stair, and then uh, this. And I believe area. we have a proposed build out uh, that we submitted as part of the plans. So unfortunately, I don't think we have. It might be in a separate document. Uh, oh, okay. It may have been, I'll pull up the document name right here. Okay. Oh, I, I did submit these electronically also. Um, there should be, oh no, it's a Word doc, uh, Word doc that is second floor build out plan. Okay, um, we'll we'll go through these and then I'll check and see if if I have that. And okay. also, Colleen, if you could check and see if, if you have that. So the, the front of the garage faces Parker Street. Um, the, the lot that we're on faces both um, Robin Hood Road, which is our address, 18 Robin Hood Road, and on Parker Street in the garage doors are accessed through Parker Street. And that's a section through, uh, section through at the back showing the stairs, section front to back. Um, uh, roof uh, framing plans. I think um, there was one of my neighbors, Doug Turner. I, I just noticed he was in the waiting room. Uh, so in the plot plan, um, there's one correction here. Okay. Um, see where it says the proposed garage is, yep. see the private way? That is actually three feet off of the property line. Because of utility lines, we had mm -hmm. to move the garage uh, away from the utility lines. So the garage fit, uh, sits back off the property line three feet, but on the Parker Road side, it is on the property line. So it's on the property line against the town of Arlington property. Yes. Um, but the property line against the private way, you're saying it is three feet. So I guess in this plan, it would be south. So three feet south of its current location. Yep. Because of the utility lines, there's a, if you look at the picture, there's a utility pole right on the corner. Oh, okay. Yep. Oh, there it is. Yep. Okay. Good. Um, so the garage, um, I see, was was recently rebuilt. Is my understanding that it, the it is, prior it, structure was condemned and this was allowed to be built in its place? Th there was there was a garage on the property at some point, but it hadn't been on the property for fifty years, as far as I know. When we bought the house, there was no garage. There was just a slab. So that is a new construction garage. Okay. Built um, like and, there was a slab. Yep. Yep. And how long have you been on the on the house? We purchased the house in 2005, July of 2005. Okay. Um, so this is so the request before the board is um, to convert the the upper floor into an accessory dwelling unit. Um, as, as most people know, sort of accessory dwelling units, if they are a part of the house, can be approved by right. Um, if they are within an accessory structure and they're within six feet of the property line, they need to get a special permit uh, from the from the zoning board of appeals. Uh, and the zoning board of appeals needs to um, make a couple of additional findings um, 
in regards to the application. So the you know the the, the structure of the the garage um, for the most part you know doesn't really impact us. The the layout of the accessory dwelling unit itself, as long as the it meets the requirements under the bylaw. Um, the question that I have a few questions, but just the the one that relates directly to the accessory dwelling unit. Um, so the exit from the accessory dwelling unit does not go directly to the outside. It only goes to the garage. Um, yes. I believe it should have an exit that goes to the, it, it should not have to go through another space that's not theirs to exit. And so I think you need, you, you can work that out with the building inspector, but I think you will need to modify the, the exit so that it, they, the resident can enter and exit without having to go through the garage. Understood. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd just like to add to that if I could real quick. Please. Uh, also, you can't uh, have an egress through a garage in the uh, building code. Mm -hmm. So they will have to uh, provide a door directly to the outside regardless. Great, thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Um, are there questions from the board about the, um, oh, I guess I should also ask um, the applicant just to confirm you are a resident in the building, in the, the main house at this time, and that you would be renting out the accessory dwelling unit. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Well, yes, or a family member. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Are there questions from members of the board in regards to the application? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, I wanted just to explore the renting a little bit. I, I gather that it, the renting isn't necessarily expected to be uh, the permanent situation. And I was wondering if the applicant has any plans to uh, be renting that out as a short-term rental or whether he's looking for uh, a longer term tenant under a lease, what, what kind of renting is he imagining? Yep, I understand that a short term rental is not possible uh, as uh, in, in the bylaws for an ADU. So if we choose to rent it, it would only be a long term rental. The long term plan uh, for the ADU is as a space for my son. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions from the board? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dubon. So I just had a couple of questions. I had driven by, and I know that on the side where you're making reference to there having to be a door, um, I noticed that there was some sort of a deck. And I didn't know where a door would go um, in reference to the deck that adjoins the garage that is between the house and the garage. So I wanted to clarify that um, because I believe the deck, so as you're in the top in the top uh, drawing that you had just a moment ago, where you show the elevation, um, it, it looks to me like there's deck in the area um, that would um, be where the door would come down if you ran it directly from the stairs. And I might be wrong about that. I just can't remember exactly. So I was wondering about whether or not there is actually a place to put a door there. That's my, my first question. And I guess the second question is that um, in terms of there being some additional drawings for the dwelling unit, portion of this. Uh, do we know what the square footage is going to be on that so that we know whether or not it meets the requirements of the ADU? Yep, I, I believe the square footage is, is just under 600 feet. And then so the um, Mr. Chairman, so we would just want to know that based upon the um, the bylaw, then you would have to just determine that the square footage of the, the uh, I guess, the gross floor area of the uh, house itself was at least, what, 1,200 square feet, which I'm sure is the case. 900, 900 is the maximum. 
Right, but it, it can be no more than 50% 50, uh, 50 of whatever the total gross floor area of the house is. Yeah, the house is approximately 2,200 square feet. Okay, so it looked like it was well within that. But getting back to the door, I just still have a question about where the door is going to come out if you have to um, go directly to the outside. Yep. I, I, To be honest, I wasn't aware of that requirement. It wasn't in any of the paperwork um, that we that we had access to. Um, so the option, I, I guess, I guess my question would be, we could. Um, go directly out to the deck and just cut into the deck uh, to put a full size door there. Or um, there is a there's a there's a existing French door in the back. I could just put up a wall and uh, make that uh, not a garage, but an entryway into the uh, into the dwelling. So I, I guess those would be the two options that I have. Um, but to be honest, it, it, it was it wasn't written anywhere, um, or any of the information I had did not indicate that uh, I could not access to it through the garage. So I would have to either you know go out to the deck, um, or I would have to uh, put up a, a wall that that separated the the garage in you know so that I had a entryway, and it would go out the French door in the back. Thank you. Yep. I'm going to try to share something different here. So hopefully you can see a photograph um, which says view along Parker Road. Um, so Ms. Ralston just forwarded along the, the other uh, that word document so it has this photograph so it just uh, just has these two photographs in the word file it doesn't have a plan and i think these two photos were also at the end of that other package okay all right so i'll go back um so are there any other questions from the board mr chair mr riccadelli uh just in terms of um the three foot setback. So is the, uh, I just wanted to ask the applicant. So uh, is the 24 by 30 foot dimension listed on the site plan, the same dimension and the whole thing was just shifted three feet away from the private way or did, did you make the, the building smaller in order to accommodate those utilities that you mentioned? Actually, uh, good point out. So the, the dimension of the garage is actually 24 by 34, I believe. I think the, I believe it's four feet longer than we originally proposed, but we did move it back three feet off of the utility line because there's a code that says you can't have a window within an arm's length or, or grabbing distance of utility line. So the whole structure had to move in away from the utility line. But the length of the garage is I believe 34, not uh, 30 as it's listed there. Okay. So then what you're saying is that the documentation we have that shows the size of the garage is actually incorrect. The plot plan is pre-construction. Okay. Yep. So, so Mr. Chair, I, I mean, I, I think that, you know, I'm sure the square footage are fine, but uh, because those dimensions are slightly different, it might be slightly different than what's listed on the, the paperwork we have. So the, the architectural well, the, plans are 24 yeah. by 34. Yeah, the architectural plans are correct. That is what was built. Um, and that will, all the permits were built, all the permits were pulled, um, all of the, the sign-offs, uh, the, 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 the engineers in the architect's drawing are all accurate. The only one that um, the plot plan, uh, the certified plot plan that has the proposed garage that was what we had pulled. I don't know. We had that from prior to getting all of the permits. I don't have an updated version of that. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, uh, anything further from the board? Mr. Chairman? 
Mr. Hanlon. Um, I'm just looking at the gross square footage, which is 720 and it's 24 by 30. The Should second, that be 24 by 34 then? No, the, the second floor, if you look at the, to match the house, the foundation first floor is larger than the second floor. Mm -hmm. So the dormer of the second floor is smaller than the footprint of the garage. And we did that to match the house. So the square foot upstairs is different than the square foot downstairs. Okay, so the 720 that's listed in the application is a reliable number for the gross square footage of the ADU, is that correct? Uh, let me just make sure that I, hold on one second. What number are we looking at? Because in the application, it talked about both the size of the building and the size of the building is larger than the size of right. the, oh, the accessory building is 720 square feet, but that's the I see. floor, not the second floor. But I mean, I, I thought that you just told me that the, for the building, it was 20, it was 24 by 34. Yes, but the second floor is not 24 by 34. Okay, but the accessory, for the accessory building here, let me just be clear, is, is that, the gross floor area of the ADU of what will be the the ADU unit? No. Okay. So, so let me get my let me just so I have it clear. Let me get my calculator out to make sure that I'm giving you the correct information. Sorry. And again, the difference is the second floor of the garage is smaller than the first floor of the garage. So the first floor of the garage is 24 by 34. The second floor of the garage, I believe, is 34 by whatever is in the drawings, but it's smaller. Hold on. Uh, 24 by 34. Oh, sorry. So, yes, um, it's this. Sorry about that. So, the, the 24 by 34 is 816 square feet. So, the, the second, so that uh, the, the 720 must be the second floor, but there is some unfinished space in the second floor uh, because of it, it's just the way that it was built. This, there's a false wall and there's just unused space up there. And that's why it's smaller than the actual, that's why it's, you know, it's just, it, it, it's, it's a knee wall. Sort th of there's a knee wall with an unused, <clears throat> there's vacant space behind the knee wall that is not going to be living space. Thank you. Yep. Again, we want we we match the garage to the house, so it's it's a not a mm -hmm. standard size. You know, it the first floor is not the same size as the second floor. All right. So before I open the meeting for public comment, I did just want to note the board is in receipt of an email. Um, uh, submitted by uh, Teresa Harrington, uh, 38 Robin Hood Road. Uh, I did not see her name on the list for this evening, so I just wanted to make sure we included her comments. Um, she, I can go ahead and share this. Uh, so just briefly, uh, yay, I'm not in favor. Um, I was on the, Understanding that the original permit obtained that this ADU was going to be for their son Marcus, but now they're changing their plan. This doesn't follow the guidelines for ADUs. Renting these units is not in compliance. Town has been very lax making sure homeowners stay true to their original plans. We have one at 44 that's not in compliance. The homeowner has attached his so called old garage to his in law apartment. Maybe the town should do a better job enforcing the rules, also, rules concerning Airbnbs. Respectfully, Teresa M. Harrington, 28 Robin Hood Road. Um, so we um, just to, to briefly ad address that um, the guidelines for accessory dwelling units do very explicitly allow for the rental of a unit. An accessory dwelling unit does not have to go to a family member. It can be rented on the open market as long as the primary residence um, is uh, is still occupied by an owner of the property. Um, and that's that was part of the intent of the of the bylaw. So with that, 
that um, public questions and comments are taken as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Members of the public will be granted time to ask questions and make comments. Members of the public who wish to speak should digitally raise their hand using the button on, I believe it's the reactions tab now. Um, in the Zoom application, those calling in by phone, please dial star nine to indicate you would like to speak. You'll be called upon by the meeting host. You'll be asked to give your name and address, and you'll be given time for your questions and comments. All questions are to be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly. Anyone wishing to address the board a second time, uh, the chair will allow those wishing to speak for first time to go first. And all public questions and comments, uh, we will keep this open probably for... Um, uh, say 10 minutes or until we've run out of people. So at this point, um, I, it's open for public comment. Are there members of the public who wish to address this application? Uh, we have a hand raised. Uh, Mr. Moore. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, I was looking at the uh, photographs which were attached to the application or one of the application documents, and I think you had them up uh, briefly. Uh, and I'm trying to figure out the view that looks down the private way, uh, looking at the door of the garage, the, um, the 2021 plot plan showed some large trees that were there, and they seem to be missing in the photograph, or is there something off about the angle I'm looking at? You see the one with the garage door? Mm -hmm. Two yep. 15-inch trees relatively close to the door, and I don't see anything. Could I ask, what happened to those trees? Mm -hmm. These these trees here adjacent on the abutting the private way. Yep. Yes. So at the corner, at the corner, uh, if you go back to the picture where the utility pole was, there was a tree at the utility pole. I just passed the utility pole that um, were um, that were were failing, um, and they were in risk of of falling on the um, on the on the utility lines, and it was the consensus of many of the neighbors, including um, my adjacent neighbor across the way, that the tree be removed so that it doesn't cause harm to the to the utility line. And I'll, I'll go one step further in that this year, if you notice down the down the side of the down the side of the garage, you can see that white tree with no leaves on it. That unfortunately had to be cut down this year because it was a dead tree also. So we did remove prior to construction. Uh, one, I mean, the, the, the one that you see in the picture that has no leaves on it, unfortunately had to move, we had to remove that this year. It, you know, it just, it was dead. And the one that was, uh, the one that we removed by the utility pole, um, we had removed. I, I'm not sure if we did that or if we did that with my neighbor at the end, if we shared the cost, um, but that was removed because it was uh, it was uh, it was dying. Uh, Mr. Chair, the only one reason I bring it up is clearly the garage was built in 2021. These trees died in 2023, or, or between 21 and 23. I'm a little concerned that construction led to the decline and failure of- Hold on, just, just to be clear, the tree by the utility pole was taken out years before the construction. The, the plot plan um, was from, I think the plot plan, the, the original plot plan that has the trees on it, I believe that was from 2006 with the proposed garage on it. So the, the trees were there as of 2006, not in 2021. That tree's been, been gone for a while. Uh, Mr. Chair, I would ask if a tree plan was filed in 2021 for this garage, which is 816 uh, square feet, which is above the 750 size, requiring tree plans, et cetera. And that actually leads me to another question, which is, in 2021, maybe it's my ignorance of the rules here, but why was the garage allowed to be up? Oh, 2020. Or there it is. 2020. Setback. Sorry, 2020. Um, the garage meets the setback requirement because the exterior walls facing Parker Street and the private way, I guess they're fire rated. Um, and by it, it, there's 
you know, the permit allows for building on property line provided that the material used is fire rated. So this, the, the house, the, you know, I, I noticed it's a pretty, much larger can of worms, which we need to discuss. Yep. Well, um, so this, typically if you face a road, it is the front yard. In this case, because this piece of property that, that is labeled town of Arlington, um, so this piece of land actually belongs to the town of Arlington. It was taken for non-payment of taxes by a prior owner of the property. Um, so technically this is a rear corner between a side yard and a rear yard. And so it can, the zero setback is allowed. Um, but as it is required that the construction be of a fire rated construction for a garage. Um, looking at the construction documents that was not done. Um, it was built using normal stick framing, um, but that's not an issue before the board at this time. Um, the board is restricted to uh, the question as to whether or not the conversion of the upper floor from its current non-use to an accessory dwelling unit is um, meets the, the criteria and the findings requirements um, of the zoning bylaw. I, I understand, Mr. Chairman, but aren't you furthering a non-compliance that was incurred in 2020, 2021? I, I don't believe there was a non-compliance when the garage was built. The, the, there wasn't a non-compliance with the construction of the garage, as far as I know. So I had I had discussed this with um, briefly with the building inspector. Um, because I had an initial question about the this adjacent piece of property. Um, so he, the determination from the building inspector was that because there was a garage there before, and this was the reconstruction of a garage, um, that that was the reason it was approved as submitted. Um, and that that was all, that's the all I know in regards to um, why it was constructed in the manner it was constructed. There okay. had been a garage there in the past. The, the cement slab of the garage was still there when we purchased the house, but the garage itself wasn't there. But mm -hmm. there had been a garage for, I don't know, a garage had been on the property, you know, as part of the original construction, there was a garage there. Right, I, I, when we bought the house, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hanlon. Well, if I understand what you're saying is, is that at least with respect to, to, I mean, I think Mr. Moore is raising things, uh, raising a question about compliance with the tree bylaw, which we can get to in a minute. But in terms of just the general compliance with the building code and with the zoning ordinance, my understanding is that the building inspector in 2020 knew everything that we do now and for reasons which seemed appropriate to him at the time issued a building permit uh, for the garage to be um, constructed in the way uh, that it is. Now we may disagree with that uh, and or may rethink that, but if there's a, if, if that's an issue, Presumably, the, it's because we disagree with the decision of the building inspector, and it's not something that uh, would be Mr. Aluya's fault. Uh, I understand, Mr. Chairman. Then, that, thank you, uh, Mr. Hanlon. That that elucidates the situation. I just, um, I will say this. I'm surprised. So, yeah. sorry to interrupt. I will say this: if you go back to the to the actual pictures. When the, when the garage was done, we actually planted five trees along Parker Street, um, red maple, two birch, uh, what kind of berry? Service, Service berry. Service berry and, and, a magnolia. and a magnolia. So mm -hmm. we actually planted five trees when the construction was done. And that's shown in the side view of the actual picture, uh, the, you know, the word doc, there they are. Trees there. So we, we did plant five trees across the side um, after the construction was done. Uh, 
Okay, I'm sure. And that's the land that's owned by the town of Arlington, I, I'm guessing. That is town property, yes. That is, yes. Well, that that's, uh, I mean, that's a good thing. I, I appreciate that having been done. Um, I just am um, uh, surprised that things went forward without questions related to the side on the private road. But thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome, Mr. Moore. Are there any further members of the public who wish to address this application? Seeing none, I will go ahead and close the public participation part of the hearing. Um, and I will bring up the zoning bylaws. So in any residential district, an accessory dwelling unit is permitted as an accessory use to any single family dwelling, two family dwelling, or duplex dwelling if all of the following conditions are met. Um, so uh, these are the requirements that will be reviewed by the building inspector um, and the zoning enforcement officer as they go forward with, with their review of the property. Um, where we are brought in is under this fifth bullet number three, an accessory building, which an accessory building shall not constitute a principal or main building by the incorporation of the accessory dwelling unit, provided that if such an accessory building is located within six feet of a lot line, then such accessory dwelling unit shall be allowed only if the Board of Appeals, acting pursuant to Section 3.3, grants a special permit upon its finding that the creation of such accessory dwelling unit is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the use of such accessory building as a private garage or other allowed use. Um, and the, the rest of this is uh, enforceable by the, by the building department. Um, so, what the, the determined that's the determination the board needs to make that um, the conversion of the upper floor from its current use to being used as an accessory dwelling unit, um, the board needs to find that the creation of such accessory dwelling unit is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the use of such building as a private garage. Um, and the way that the board has typically made these determinations um, is with respect to the special permit criteria. Three, 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 there we go. Um, so the use requested is listed as the special permit use in the regulations for the applicable district or is so designated in the bylaw we just reviewed there under section uh, 593. Uh, the requested use is essential or desirable to the public convenience or welfare. Um, the enhancement of, of property in town, along with the incorporation of additional residences in a way that does not uh, create an undue um, uh, increase in density is, a, is essential and desirable to the town. Uh, requested use will not create undue traffic congestion or unduly impair pedestrian safety. Um, the use of this building as an accessory dwelling unit um, would, would possibly uh, increase the, the number of uh, cars available by one, um, but that is up to uh, the owner as to uh, how they would handle that. Uh, the requested use will not overload any public water drainage or sewer system or any other municipal system to such an extent that the requested use or any developed use in the immediate area or any other area of town will be unduly subjected to the hazards affecting health, self, safety, or the general welfare. Uh, we will be adding um, a single kitchen and a single restroom, um, which should not cause any overload. Um, uh, the special reg any special regulation for the use as may be provided in this bylaw are fulfilled, and that is that the board would determine that um, the use as an accessory dwelling unit is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than its current use. Uh, the requested use will not impair the integrity or character of the district or adjoining districts. Um, it is highly unlikely that anyone would notice that it's being used as a, an accessory dwelling unit as opposed to um, the appearance it has now. It is there are no exterior modifications to the house as a part of this application, with the exception, as we had discussed, about uh, providing proper legal egress, and that'll be worked out with the building department. Um, and the requested use will not, by its addition to the neighborhood, cause an excess of the use that could be detrimental to the character of said neighborhood. Um, 
and the incorporation of an accessory dwelling unit in this existing structure would only add one unit um, to an existing neighborhood and the the lot size that's there currently is fairly generous um, in the neighborhood would not be um, unduly burdened by the addition of this accessory dwelling unit. Um, I would ask the board if there are any additional questions in regards to this application. Seeing none. Mr. Chair, could I ask one Mr. question? Gunnar. Yes, please. Um, so uh, under uh, section 5.9.2, the accessory dwelling unit regulations under under B, there's a note about um, accessory dwelling units being subject to all applicable requirements of state building code, state fire code, and the openings um, with being protected uh, where they're a certain distance from the property line. Mm -hmm. So, you know, knowing that the building inspector approved the building permit, um, I guess I'm just wondering. Is it our is it our responsibility to make that determination if if you feel or we feel that um, perhaps it, it's not um, meeting the fire rating that would be required under our code, or is it the building inspector already made that determination and now this is um, uh, allowable because it, it received a permit? Mm -hmm. So it, it's the responsibility of the building department to review the final application for compliance with the state building code. And as such, they will need to make that determination as to whether the, you know, the way the windows are, um, are in compliance with the building code or if they would need to make um, some adjustment to that. Um, and also because of the proximity of the structure to the lot line, does that, you know, are there setback requirements that would uh, need to be met in terms of, um, you know, fire protection? But that would be within, that's not within our purview. That's the purview of the building, of the building inspector. But we could put it in as a condition if. Um, no, I just, I, I'm just curious about that, uh, just because it came up here, and I think it came up on one previous ADU case where someone was adding to a structure that had been fire rated and they weren't proposing something fire rated. I, I think we probably had the same question and conversation, but I wanted to be sure. Thank you. Okay. Um, and then, um, unfortunately, I do need to, to run in a second. Um, I do have some concerns um, about sort of the the openness of some of the documentation we have that it's not overly firm as to exactly some of the sizes um, of things, and we don't have an accurate layout of the upper floor. Um, and so I would put in front of the board, ask ask the board what their consideration would be um, if they feel they have enough information or if they would want to. Uh, request that additional information be provided. Um, the other thing I had wanted to just briefly, uh, it's not related to our case and what we need to find, um, but I would just notif notice for the applicant that that strip of land that belongs to the town of Arlington is the town of Arlington's land. It is not you. It's not your property, um, but you are using it as your property. Um, and I would just caution you that you're doing that at your own risk. Um, that the town can can you know take possession and take ownership of that land. Uh, that land was granted to the town of Arlington for uh, non-payment of taxes by a prior resident of that house. Um, I would strongly encourage you to uh, discuss that with the town um, whether there's a a way that you could either acquire reacquire that piece of land or obtain an easement for uh, access to the garage across that piece of land. Um, but I just caution you that um, it's it, the access to the drive, uh, access to the garage is entirely off of town's property um, nope. and that that's at your own risk. I, I um, completely understand. And I believe the ha we have the easement for the garage, for the, for the driveway. Um, I can confirm that. Um, and completely understand that that you know the the land that we've been maintaining for 18 years is not our land. Yeah. 
Okay. Just wanted to confirm that you were aware of that. Yep. Um, with that, I apologize that I do have to run. Um, I will leave this hearing in the capable hands of Mr. Hanlon um, to go forward. Thank you, Mr. Klein. So now I get to be I get to be chair for for a while. Um, so the question that's outstanding is whether uh, we need to have a correction of of some of the material that is in front of us that shows where that, that particularly that shows an accurate view of the um, where the ADU unit is is going to be and provides uh, updated dimensions and clarifies the information that we already have. Um, and I guess that it sort of is up to you whether you need to see anything like that. I would encourage us to be thinking about whether that information provided to us as opposed to putting a condition saying that updated information needs to be provided to inspectional services uh, may cause uh, a waste of our time and other people's time as well, unless we think it's genuinely material uh, to our decision in the case. So I guess the I I think that it would we have in the past uh, included a condition that says in effect uh, that the applicant will uh, at the time of applying for a building permit uh, update the uh, and correct all of the the uh, uh, the drawings that were are before us. Uh, is that enough, or do you want to try for a continuance and, and get a good look at it yourselves before acting on the case? Mr. Chair, I'm sorry, I didn't see who said Adam. Yeah, Mr. Yeah. Lamont. Uh, I know I'm a kind of new here, but I don't particularly feel comfortable voting given the documents we have in front of us. Um, you know, not for sure knowing what the square footage is and then also the um the issue with the separate entrance and egress uh i know you know we can leave that up to the building inspector but it seems like given what i've heard tonight there may be a couple of things that have transpired or something i i, I don't know um it'd be up to what uh, others here uh feel but that's kind of my feeling that i would like to see more updated documents uh, in, that reflect in, things. Just to be clear, the only document that we're talking about is the plot plan, correct? That's the only document in question? Well, I think we need to see a layout of the proposed ADU, as well as what those dimensions are and what the square footage of that is. That uh, should be in the construction doc. Not the, the not the layout, but the finished space area should be in the construction dock of the of the garage. The garage plans has a second floor layout with square footage. I'm just not convinced of its accuracy based on the, everything so far. The architectural drawings. I I can't provide anything other than the architectural drawings of the building. What what else? What what, what would you propose that I show that has that what can I show that would be more convincing than the architectural drawing? Of well, the I think my my thing is you are saying that the walls of the second floor are inset from the building, and that's from... shown, and that is shown on the, the 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 drawings that I submitted. That's all in there. The framing docs show everything. The dimension I see on the second floor plan shows a 24 by 34 foot space, but that doesn't drive with what we're hearing and then what we see. Hold on. What the second floor? That would be A2 in your documents? Um, yeah, that's the one I'm looking at. And that that's that's what, I'm looking at what's in the agenda, what we have available to us. If there's other things that maybe were sent that we don't have in front of us, I can't speak to that, but I'm just looking at what I have in front of myself right now. I don't have it too. Hold on, I'm looking for A2. I, I have a printout of what I submitted. And in the printout of what I submitted, I, I thought I had a layout of 
A2. Uh, A2, there it is. No, that's the, A2 is the outside. Uh, A2 is at our house. Uh, hmm. In what I submitted, what I, what, I, what I think I submitted had a layout. Um, apparently it's not in the document that you have. Yeah, it's not in the agenda for tonight's meeting. Hmm. Could you describe, Mr. Aluya, what what is the document that you think you have that we're missing? What 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 what, what does it have on it that H U does not have? I can, if I, you allow me to share my screen, I can show it to you. Um, Mr. Ralston, does he have the permission to do that? Let me, let me look and see. Oops, I can't do that. Uh, let me just, uh, here we go. This is, uh, this is what I thought I submitted with my paperwork. And you can see where it says attic. Those are the, those are the, uh -huh. so the 24 is minus the two feet. So it's 20 by 34. So you have four of these setbacks because the outside foundation of the second floor is smaller than the outside foundation. Of the, I thought I had submitted this um, with my paperwork. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll just add to make sure you check what the definition of the gross floor area is in the zoning bylaws because it's it's a little bit more nuanced than what you just described. Understood. Um, but the entirety of the garage is, even if it was the full footprint of the garage, it's still only 816. The 34 by 24, so it could never be more than 816. Yeah, I guess I can clarify. I'm I, you know, I want this to to go through. I just want to make sure that we're getting accurate information and that the record reflects yep. the correct information that is there. Perfect. So other than the updated plot plan and this document that shows the um all the measurements in the proposed layout is there anything else that you would like to see i think it would be good to see what the proposal for the separate entrance is because that is a requirement of the zoning bylaw that we're looking at and I uh, just want to make sure we see that. And I'll leave it up to the building inspector to determine the rest of it in terms of the actual construction of it for its proper fire ratings and all that. Yep. Yeah, which is the section of the of the uh, bylaw that we're looking at? So the, the, the separate, the means of egress thing, that's in the building code itself. Um, but the separate entrance is under the 5.9.2B. And it is uh, one and bullet point three. So uh, what I'm asking, what I'm wondering is if to read that all out, it says an accessory dwelling unit shall maintain a separate entrance either directly from the outside or through an entry hall or corridor shared with the principal dwelling sufficient to meet the requirements of the state building code for safe egress. Um, so if this was actually in the principal dwelling, uh, then you could go in through that, right? So the problem, if there is a problem, is just that this is not the principal dwelling. The accessory building is, is a garage. Um, and so that's the reason why it is that that there needs to be a separate entrance. I think so, according to to as a zoning point of view, but in a building code point of view, um, putting on my other hat, you can't egress through a garage. Well, that's fair enough, but I don't. We're not. We're not the 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 zoning the. The building inspector administrates the building code as a state law, and not as a, and we don't ad administer the building code. So, if it isn't a zoning requirement, then I don't really think that we have any any business uh, attempting to deal with it. Somebody that's that's a job of a different agency. the The question, really, in my mind, is whether uh, is 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 whether that's really a zoning. Uh, 
a zoning thing as well. And I guess here, the way it's written, I'd, I'd sort of take the view um, that it is. So, uh, It puts us in an awkward position because, of course, the the thing has to be sufficient to meet the requirements of the state building code for, building code for safe egress, which puts us right back into dealing with the building code. Um, I personally feel more comfortable letting Mr. Champa deal with that than than doing it for our, on our own. But uh, what I take it that you are looking for, Mr. LeBlanc, is for uh, Mr. Uh, Alia to decide what option he wants to take here and see architecturals that show uh, the separate exit, the separate uh, uh, egress. Yeah, I think just from our zoning point of view of showing the entrance directly from the outside, because I believe that's the one applicable to this situation. And then, like you're yes, saying, let, let the building inspector deal with the other components related to the building. Uh, code. Okay, so what we need then, if if I understand you Mr. correctly, Mr. LeBlanc, from from Mr. Aluya, is essentially the document that he's just shown, maybe adjusted in some way. If, I'm not quite sure what what aspect of what he's just shown you. I mean, I'm trying to figure out what. Suppose he just puts in the document that he just that that he just showed us. Um, he's still a fairly long distance away from nine hundred, and I'm wondering whether now we haven't really worked worked out what this means in terms of the principal dwelling and so forth. But I think it's we're are we getting over fifty percent? Probably not that either. I mean, you know, if it's if it's just a matter of understanding just how far he short, falls short of the minimum, it's a bit much to have him redo the document, unless there's something specific that we can point to that says we don't think that it's that the document is right on this thing or this thing or that. And the other thing is, you need you need to show a design that 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 is sufficient to what is normally given to us that shows where the uh, separate egress is. Is that right? Is there, no. is there anything else that you would like him to have? No, I think it's it's mostly that. And again, just I, I understand that the whole square footage thing is basically a non-issue, but I'm just, I don't know, I'm just being a stickler to that, I guess. I guess so. I, you know, I th would encourage us, if, if the difference is between 816 and 817 and the standard is 900, I am not entirely sure that it makes sense for us to be doing that but if you think there's a substantial possibility that when you do it all correctly that it's uncertain whether or not you'll meet the minimum uh, the maximum size requirement then we can certainly ask for that and i it seems to me that what he's already shown us probably gives us all we need to work with and i'm not sure what we could ask him to do more uh, on the question of the external egress, that is something that we haven't even started with. So he'd have to produce something more demonstrating that how how he did attempt to achieve that. Yeah, um, you know, I'll I'll let others weigh in. Uh, um, well, I'm let's see. He would, um, you know, if we do the one, if he's got the document that we already have, unless we have reason why we have to ask him to redo it, then he's already got that part. So the the difficulty is showing where the external egress would be, and that requires some more thinking and a decision on his part, and and deciding how he wants to do that. Uh, and providing us with that document. What uh, in it, now the alternative for us asking for it is to rely on Mr. Champa to enforce the state building code, and and he would presumably do this in uh, in either event. I wonder if others on the board have a view as to whether they feel that uh, we need to continue this to provide this additional information or not. Mr. Chairman. Mr. DuPont. So this feels a little cumulative to me based upon Mr. Riccardelli's comments and then Mr. LeBlanc's comments and then Mr. Klein's comments. 
But I guess in sum for me, I mean, I first of all, I believe that based upon the application itself, the gross floor area is established, um, whatever that number is, because my first concern going in is just making sure that it comports with that, you know, no larger than 50% or 900 square feet, um, whichever is smaller. And if the other members of the board are in agreement, I think that that's been established with the um, application itself. So I, I, I take that as sort of step one. And then if what we're talking about is then, okay, we need clarification for the layout and the square footage of the living space, I, I suppose I'd be comfortable if there was just a requirement that this plan that Mr. Aluya has provided to us was uh, provided for the record to supplement the record so that it's there for anybody who goes later to, to look at it. And, and so I would be comfortable with that. And then I guess to Mr. LeBlanc's point, I think that you know the whole idea of the egress gets pulled back into this portion of the zoning bylaw by virtue of reference to the building code, if if that's correct, I guess I guess it is. Is that correct, Mr. LeBlanc? So, yeah, it seems kind of circular. So, yeah. but but I'm assuming that you know the there's the condition that this plan uh, with the layout of the floor and then you know a plan that would be submitted to the inspectional services showing egress in conformity with the provisions of this bylaw and the state building code. I mean, that gives Mr. Champa enough of a roadmap to be able to say, oh, okay, well, here's what I got to do. I'm sure he knows that already. But if if we wanted to, I suppose we could put that into a decision if we were inclined to do so, and then just sort of move ahead if other members of the board are comfortable with that. And, and the last, point I will make, and I think that Mr. Hanlon's already addressed this, is, you know, we need to stick to those things that are in front of us. But I do have a concern, you know, as a lawyer about that strip of land that is owned by the town, uh, because there is actually an access issue, but I don't think that it affects the use as a dwelling unit, an accessory dwelling unit. So I'm willing to forego that as a concern or a discussion. But I do think it raises an issue that needs to be dealt with uh, down the line. So I'm generally comfortable moving ahead with the submission of the plan showing the layout and then the egress that conforms with the bylaw slash uh, building code. Mr. Chair. Mr. Co Mr. Holy. Just to add to what Mr. DuPont was mentioning, the about that lot piece of land owned by Arlington. We are in this in this hearing looking at a conversion of a, an existing dwelling structure, right? So we are looking at kind of conformity or non-conformity of the existing structure in a way. So should we look into the dwelling structure, the accessory structure relative to that lot line or not is more a question there as a point because uh, that is the one point I was hung up on as well that, that was raised by Mr. DuPont. My, my understanding is that Mr. Uh, Klein has discussed that with council who has indicated that this is an issue that the applicant ought to be taking up separately with the town as the older yeah. owner of that strip and recognize both the jeopardies in and, and put and attempting to come to some sort of an agreement to um, put this on a sounder footing um, i i as a lawyer too i i would hesitate for us to be attempting to get into the property issue that is at stake here and don't believe that there's anything in that that would prevent us from approving uh, this application and and I don't think that that uh, Mr. Heim thinks so either. I, I agree. Um, the only part where I wanted more clarification is that the the accessory structure is at a zero property line right now. 
and not the table dimensional table required um, whatever 25 feet but that is an existing non-conformity in a way for us at this time at this juncture it is an existing non-conforming non-conformity correct i well that's i i don't that is a difficult legal question because it's not a prior non-conformity it's a non-conformity only if you assume which i do not that mr champa's predecessor got it wrong and uh and issued the building permit in error and then there it is and i'm not even sure what what to do about that and uh but don't think that it is the function of this board to try to figure that out the, okay. the question for the the notice that the the business about fire rating is a is both a building code issue and it's it's a question that has to do with the location of the garage as such uh, there's no equivalent provision in the zone in the ADU bylaw where well, that says just says if you're within six feet you need a special permit and then we have to apply the criteria that we uh, that we have applied right right so uh, sorry um, this is the last one uh, if I may share my screen quickly I, the, the section where um, the request for their application has this comment. I was just trying to understand this. So, which requires, so this is section 5.9.2 B13 requires that the by right ADU conversion must be a minimum of six feet from the property line and that the proposed ADU is closer than. So, so the, the premise is that it is. Okay, um, I probably understood that it's a more legal question to answer than this one. Okay, um, right. All right, understood. To Thank be you, Mr. closer Chair. to six feet just for the garage, you need to meet the fire standards. Those fire standards are not referred to in the ADU bylaw. Right, right. Okay, Thank you. So, Mr. Dupont, I'm the something close to this is at the time of building uh, the building permit, the applicant shall provide drawings or a plan uh, showing compliance with section 9.2 uh, B1 about bullet three uh, in conformity with this bylaw and with the state building code. Is that basically right? Yes. Uh, I bollocks that up a little bit, but. Okay, so I guess the question that I'd like us all to, to figure out is whether we think that we need to continue and see that all of that himself and, and uh, carry this agenda over till uh, the next meeting when we can when we can address this, which I think will be August 29th, uh, or whether we're satisfied with Mr. Dupont's condition. I I personally would think that it that, that we don't that 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 are seeing this and expressing our opinions on it I don't think that it will influence our if assuming that assuming that the that that the uh, applicant shows what we, the condition says that he needs to show our seeing it first is not likely to add to the quality of the decision as compared to Mr. Champa doing it and uh and it would cause a very considerable delay. Mr. Hammond. And Mr. Riccardelli. I, I, I agree. I think, um, you know, I, I would hate to hold the applicant up. I think I think that I would be, you know, I'm in favor of, um, of the application. And I think um, provided that they submit the plan that we were just shown and uh, the condition that Mr. DuPont um, crafted that I think I think that I would be comfortable voting tonight. Right. I need to I need to ask your forbearance, and if you could give me about a minute for a break, I need to uh, I need to uh, to do this. It's uh, the I will say that I the we had a similar problem with the high eighth case. Uh, where we they, I think it was that one where the question came up having to do with where the uh, with where the with what the uh, average uh, finished grade was, 
and the applicant uh, added provided additional uh, uh, after we had acted on the application because we had seen it just as we've seen the document that Mr. Aluya has. Uh, the document was later submitted for the record, and I would propose that rather than waiting until Mr. Aluya formally uh, submits the document that we've seen, if that document is all that's necessary, that we proceed at least to act in that connection, and then uh, and then uh, and then stick with the condition that 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 we have, since the document is in existence and really just needs to be there in order to make the record uh, the record accurate and make it easy for people to find uh, the document that that we're actually uh, are relying on if we are inclined to improve to approve the application. Um, So if there's if there's nothing more the, the uh, I suppose that uh, let me see, if the board is inc is inclined to approve this application it will uh, want to uh, do that um, in with the three standard conditions uh, and I'm looking hard for a copy of those for me to to read into the record with me I need to I need to split my screen um there we go let's see All right. So the three standard conditions uh, are uh, as follows. Uh, the first one is uh, final plans. The final plans and specifications approved by the board for the permit shall be the final plans and specifications submitted to the building inspector of the town of Arlington in connection with this application for zoning relief. There shall be no deviation during construction from approved plans and specifications without the express written approval of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. The second deals with enforcement. The building inspector is hereby notified that he is to monitor the site and should proceed with appropriate enforcement procedures at any time that he determines that violations are present. The building inspector shall proceed under section 3.1 of the zoning bylaw under the provisions of chapter 40, section 21D and institute non-criminal complaints. If necessary, the building inspector may also approve and institute appropriate criminal action also in accordance with section 3.1. And the final one is the board shall maintain continuing jurisdiction with respect to this special permit grant. In addition to that, Mr. DuPont has proposed a condition that would say in substance at the time of building uh, uh, building of uh, building uh, permit approval, uh, the applicant shall submit or the a plan that shows uh egress uh in accordance with uh, section uh, b1 bullet 3 of the of the uh, zoning bylaw uh and conformity with the state building code yes does any is there any, are there any other conditions that uh, uh that any member of the board thinks would be appropriate Mr. Chairman, I don't know if it was a condition, but we did agree that he will submit the floor plan that we viewed uh, moments ago. So I yes. don't know if that was something. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I wonder. Well, why don't we just make it make it a condition at the time of building inspection and at the time of the building permit. Uh, pl the plan that A two uh, shall be submitted as part of as part of the uh, or shall be submitted to the building inspector. Sounds good. And but nevertheless, in addition to that, it would be uh, we Mr. Lee should provide a copy of that for the record in this case. Okay. We we won't delay decision on that, but. All right, so that should be the the fifth decision, the uh, the uh, fifth condition. 
Is yeah. are there is there anything else? Okay, the chair will entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman. Mr. DuPont. Uh, I move that the uh, application uh, for the ADU be approved subject to the three standard conditions and the two additional conditions that the chair just enumerated. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. LeBlanc. Um, we'll do a roll call. Well, let me see if I can. Uh, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Ricardelli. Aye. Mr. LeBlanc. Aye. Um, who am I missing? Mr. Holy. Mr. Holy, there you are. Aye. Uh, and, and the chair votes aye. So thank you, uh, Mr. Louis. Uh, you've got some additional things that you'll need to provide for the building inspector, but if you could file the uh, uh, document that you showed us uh, earlier uh, so that we can have it in the record, we would greatly appreciate it. Yep, I will send that through. E can I send that through email? Or do you need a printed copy? No, you can send it through email. All right, I will send that through email tomorrow. And I think there was one other outstanding. Will I get a, 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 a communication of some sort that says what the other outstanding item is? I think it was final plans approved by, I was writing it down, but I, I just want to make sure I understand the other follow-up. The material that will be provided to the building inspector? Oh, got it. Okay, perfect. Okay. All right. So I'll send the plans. Uh, I'll I'll email them right now. Okay. Thank right. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, all right. So we're now ready to uh, turn to the second hearing on our our list. Uh, it's fourteen Oakland Street. Yes. Uh, Mr. Anessi. Go, Mr. Hanlon. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, I am here this evening with uh, my two clients, uh, David uh, Turnquist and Kath Catherine Vashika, and also with Alexander Vu, uh, uh, the architect. Now, you may recall at the last hearing that uh, I was into my <clears throat> opening statement and uh, the chair brought to my attention the fact that there had been uh, two cases decided uh, at the last zoning hearing that might have a bearing on what I was uh, trying to achieve. Uh, uh, with that, uh, I uh, uh, requested that the matter be continued so I would have an opportunity to read those decisions, which I have done. Uh, I have read both, and I did submit a memo to the members of the board, which hopefully you've received, uh, by the way, along with uh, many, many uh, emails from neighbors who are in favor of what is being proposed by uh, my clients. The, the case that I looked at uh, uh, very carefully was uh, 48 Oakland. Uh, now, 48 Oakland uh, uh, was a bit different than my case uh, in that uh, 48 Oakland uh, was decided under section 1.8, uh, sorry, that 8.1.3. And uh, as you may recall, 8.1.3 had two paragraphs, paragraph A and paragraph B. Paragraph A essentially said that if you were doing an addition completely within the foundation uh, then you probably did not need zoning relief because you essentially were conforming. And the chair uh, did, uh, in the 48 Oakland uh, uh, decision, did uh, uh, indicate that as well. Uh, uh, and the homeowners in that case indicated that uh, uh, their lot was conforming uh, even though they had three stories. And they had three stories, but the entire addition was going to occur within the foundation. Uh, the My case involved uh, a situation where the addition was not going to occur within the foundation. Therefore, uh, I had to look to subparagraph B. 
Now, it's interesting also to note that when I applied for my relief, I applied for relief under the uh, dimensional uh, provision in the bylaw uh, for a special permit. I also applied for a variance. I conceded very quickly to points made by, I believe, uh, Mr. DuPont and perhaps uh, Mr. Hanlon as well, uh, that in fact, I would never be able to establish uniqueness relating to my variance request. And uh, I conceded that. And if you're familiar with uh, Oakland Ave, you can see why I would have conceded that. Uh, because quite frankly, a lot of the houses on uh, uh, Oakland Ave are similar. Uh, the characteristics are similar as well. So I did wrote a memo uh, or a brief to the board. And essentially what I talked about in that brief was that the board in the 48 Oakland Ave case decided to hear that case under the provisions of subparagraph B, despite the fact that uh, the applicant in that case probably did not even need relief uh, because again, they were building their addition within the foundation. Uh, but I went on to uh, quote from some of the comments made in that case. And uh, uh, one of the comments that uh, again was made uh, was we're going to decide the case using the uh, the parameters of subparagraph B. Uh, the now uh, again I don't have that in my case. However, what I do have is I have everything else. I believe okay. Uh, I have uh, the uh, the design standards that we, we'd be complying with. Uh, we're in R one zone. Uh, we're not really introducing a, uh, an addition to the neighborhood that is much different than a lot of the house, other houses in the neighborhood. Indeed, one of the emails which you received from an owner at 10 Oakland Ave uh, basically uh, uh, talked about the fact that she did uh, pretty much what my client is attempting to do now 25 years ago. And uh, she was able to get it uh, 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 to build it 25 years ago. As we all know, uh, there are statutes and limitations uh, that apply as well as a 10 and a six year statute of limitations. So even if a building had been built years ago uh, uh, without uh, uh, reference to the building plans, uh, if 10 years go by, the building inspector cannot uh, go ahead and uh, stop that uh, building from continuing to exist. So again, I had facts that were very similar. Now, the one issue I did have was of course, that I had not filed under 8.3.1. I argue in my memo that that shouldn't make any difference because uh, what, when I applied for relief, I applied for relief under the dimensional uh, aspects of uh, uh, zoning bylaw. And that told the world and put the world on notice that my client was seeking to put an addition on their home. So that was notice. And indeed, historically, I go back a long way with the zoning board, historically years ago, uh, if in fact uh, uh, a, a property had been advertised as a variance, uh, if in fact the board decided to, and, but, and not advertised as a special permit, if the board decided to go along with granting a special permit, since the greater relief had been advertised, the boards historically uh, in prior years uh, would conclude and did conclude that nevertheless, the matter could go forward because the relief being sought by way of a special permit was less relief than that being sought by way of a variance. So what, what I'm here to argue, and I'm gonna have Mr. Alexander Boo talk with you in a few minutes as well. What I'm here to argue is that 
we feel we fit within the language of subparagraph B. And I think subparagraph B uh, was put in the bylaw for a reason. And it was put in the bylaw uh, for precisely the kind of a situation we're talking about. My plan's home was built in 1939, okay? Uh, it goes way back. And again, uh, uh, building inspectors uh, over the years had an opportunity to uh, come to the owners of the property uh, from 1939 on and say, look, you got three stories. You shouldn't have three stories, okay? Uh, and shut them down. That never happened, okay? Uh, and so that uh, ability on the part of the building uh, uh, inspector would be foreclosed at this point. Uh, uh, with respect to how this uh, addition would fit into the neighborhood, uh, I feel that it would fit in very nicely in the neighborhood. In my memo, I argue about the characteristics of Oakland Ave, uh, starting down the bottom, going up to the top, uh, how the houses, to, to some extent, a bit varied, but in many respects, very similar. What my client is proposing is not substantially different than what would uh, exist in the neighborhood uh, now and even after the fact. And I think uh, uh, that argument falls within the uh, four corners of the language in subparagraph B. Query, is the uh, applicant's proposal going to be substantially di uh, different than what is in the neighborhood? And will it uh, be a detriment to what is in the neighborhood? And my, my argument to you is that that is not the case. Now, that having been said, why don't I let the real person uh, who knows more about this than I do, the architect, uh, maybe uh, say some words to you as well. Uh, Mr. Inessi, let me just sort of... Oh, by the way, by the way uh, can I just say this, uh, Mr. Hanlon? Uh, I did reach out to the building inspector uh, about the issue I talked about. Uh, in terms of whether I should go forward. You're noticing it. And I never heard back, okay? Right. Uh, or whether I should uh, withdraw it and file anew. Uh, so I said to myself, why not go ahead before the board, okay? I've not heard from uh, the uh, building commissioner. Uh, let's get before the board. And so that's what, that's what I've done. I'm sorry. So I, the, let's just back up for a second and remind ourselves where we where we currently stand. Um, last time when we started, and I don't think we got very far into, and we probably need some reflection, we need some ref refreshment of our recollection um, of exactly what the proposal is and how the layout is and what it looks like and that sort of thing. Yeah. But the initial question, the threshold question was whether or not uh, this is introducing a new nonconformity, or whether it's, uh, or whether or not it's the extension of an existing nonconformity, and that in turn depends upon whether the existing house is two stories or three stories. Yeah. And I, I take it from your submissions that your view at this point and what you're submitting to us is uh, that it's three stories, and so what we're talking about is the extension of a of a nonconformity. Correct. Yes. Um, I do know for that, Mr. from Mr. Champa, that that is the view of the building department. That that it is it is currently a three story, and you've submitted for the record two other things that tend to show that. Uh, one is a uh, is a plot plan uh, dated in two, 2022 as opposed to 2020, which is the original one you used. Uh, that in which the surveyor said it's three stories. And you also have got several drawings that do not exactly calculate the average grade, but do, I think, are, are supposed to be show to us uh, exactly why it is that the basement does count as a story because the ceiling is more than uh, four feet, six inches above the average finished grade. Um, so th that's the evidence that we have to rely on. And if we agree with you, uh, that the existing building is a three-story. Then it seems to me clear that uh, that section 
uh, 8.1.3b potentially applies, in which case the standard that we have to apply uh, is whether or not the extension of the nonconformity is more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing nonconformity, which we normally do by looking at the special, the usual special permit, uh, uh, special permit criteria uh, to inform that that decision. So, sort of legally, that's that's where we are. So the first thing, I guess, is to make sure that that uh, we're satisfied that we know enough to conclude that. It, the building inspector is right that this is uh, three stories to start with, and then we're into essentially looking at the usual special permit considerations uh, in terms of uh, we know where we know what authorizes the special permit that would be 8.1.3b, and then we have the various criteria that that uh, that you've addressed. So uh, let me just ask, ask the board members if if that seems clear enough to them and whether this would be a good time to turn to Mr. Vu and some pictures and to see more, get more into the details. Does anyone on the board have any further questions? I mean, there'll be lots of time for further questions, but let's uh, let Mr. Vu do his thing. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Um, so is there drawings that you have or should I share my screen? You should share your screen. Share my screen, okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Great. So we, I think we're all agreed that it's a, for now that it's uh, the existing non-conform, non-conforming three stories. And we design or addition uh, an extension of non-conforming three stories. Uh, we're, we're proposing to do a uh, 18 by 17 footprint of uh, a, low, a low first floor, a recreational space off of the existing uh, unfinished basement. And it's a very simple box where also uh, the design is to extend the uh, design intent of the existing house into the non-conforming three-story. And all this, all the additions is all within the setbacks and meets all the requirements of the site plan. Uh, this is a second floor, we call it the second story a flame, family room extension of existing living room, kitchen, and dining. And it's 19 by 18. And the third story is of the existing th third story bedrooms, floor, uh, fourth bedroom, bathroom, and extending extension down to the back. So that's our three stories, floor plans. Any questions? So this is the, uh, in the, in these drawings, uh, Oakland Avenue is to the left, correct? Yes. And this is located in the rear yard? Yes, extension. Uh, yard. So tell us a little bit about the, where, what, how far is, how far is, the, what is the depth of the rear setback here? Uh, the site plan, do we have a site plan? I think in the tabulation it says something like fifty-nine feet, but it's a yes, it's a very deep backyard. Uh, it's at least that, yes. yes. On the over sur uh, survey uh, plot plan. Yes. Yeah, it's a it's a still like a double lot, very long. Uh, yeah. And backyard. then, what is what what is located behind that? Is the, I mean, I take it it's another lot that is on Harvard Street, and uh, how far is the is the structure? Uh, in that from the from the rear lot line. Uh, I would. <clears throat> I mean, I guess you. If if the owner is here, Ms. Beeksha, or, or is, may, may actually have a better feel for how far away her neighbor in the back yes, is I... than than any of us. Mr. Hamlin, I'm I'm not a good judge of distance, but I would say it's approximately 100, 125 feet or so. It's it, can you see that the plot plan that I'm sharing with you? 
Um, I do see the pot plan. Yes. Yeah, so, so the uh, apologize. I, I took me a while to find this. So the the back corner, the left, uh, the north back corner of the house, the two story house, it's seventy yards from the back corner to the uh, property, the rear property line. Right. And we're extending out. We're proposing extending out 18, 18 feet. Right. From seventy feet. And the question we're addressing now is the lot in the back, which is, for the record, 11 yeah. Harvard Street, is also quite a deep lot before you get to the structure yes. on it. And I'm trying to get an estimate about how deep that is. And uh, I I think Mr. Turnquist suggested that it was it was deep. I'm, he guessed maybe 100 feet or so, but yeah. uh, but it certainly it's not close. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. All right. I think that's fair. What is the um, total square footage of this addition? The total square footage, let's see. Um, I believe we have, I think we have it in our, uh, our, our application. It's on your dimensional form. And the dimensional form, form. I think. Yes, it's yeah. on the dimensional form. So it's. I guess if you subtract 2221, which is the existing from the proposed 3211, you get 990. Is that correct? I think we're close. Um, so that's more than 750, and I'm wondering whether you also need a special permit for a large addition. If that's the case, we certainly do. Now, I do notice one thing, and which may complicate things a little bit, and maybe we should just kind of assume that you're going to be, we're going to look at that criteria as well. Um, but there's a if I'm not mistaken, in the back, there there is an overhang, a, a a room that is, I think, on the second floor, that extends out in the back. It's supported by, uh, it's supported by pillars, uh, and you can see it in the pictures that were submitted by the original application. If you look, sort of. The first one sh kind of shows where this looks, and then uh, the last one uh, shows it sticking out there. And if that's a pre-existing building within the foundation, maybe that gets subtracted out. But I'm a little bit unclear uh, of what we're really actually dealing with here. See, these are the proposed elevations so that right. they're going to show you what you're going to do. And it would have been helpful, I think, to have ele elevation showing the existing situation as well. But you can see in the plot plan a reference, a, an indication of where the, uh, the one-story one overhang. overhang is. Right. And the question is whether there's any possibility that that brings you under 750. But I will say this, that the criteria in this particular case, the criteria for the large addition would not be a great deal different than the one for a special. So we may we may want to just go back, just assume that this is a large addition and proceed and proceed accordingly. So in the new in the new drawings that you submitted, you there are some I just wanted to make sure that the record that they're sort of explained for the record, but they purport to show that this as is they are evidence that this really is a three-story building now and i wonder if either you or mr anessi wants to draw walk us through those and show the, how that works how it works mr. Why is it? yeah the the i will say that that the drawings that i saw uh don't really contain a specific i mean they kind of you look at it and can sort of tell that it looks like uh, this is a third story because of the four and a half uh, feet uh, difference, but average finish grade isn't calculated. So I'm a little bit, I think that's, that some explanation would be useful. Those would be in the new drawings that were submitted uh, after the, 
in, in, in the last few days in preparation for this hearing and not in preparation for the hearing before. Boo, can you do that? Uh, so the, the exposed uh, lower level, called the basement, existing basement, it's over two thirds in terms of um, linear feet than the area that is covering up the upper level uh, up, up the yard uh, adjacent to the street, open street. So look at this. So from so from the from the existing driveway, uh, uh, the garage that goes into the basement from this corner around to this corner, and works its way up is the basement is exposed, the full level. So it is over fifty percent of the uh, the linear feet of the. Uh, the footprint of the existing house. More than one half. All right. Um, Mr. Chair. I, I, is that Mr. Riccardelli? I've I'm sorry, I've I've turned uh, off looking at my looking at my hard drive and I can't see who spoke. It's Mr. LeBlanc. Mr. LeBlanc. Um, I think the the one uh, drawing that they submitted that helps uh, helped me was the updated site plan because it did show um, the existing average grade and then also gives a dimension for the basement ceiling height. And when you uh, do the math with those, you get a number greater than four foot six. So to me, that that helped me understand um, the basement county as a story. Okay, I'm, I'm just I'm going to pause here and just and let others begin asking uh, questions. If you could, I've I've I'm stepped away so that I can't see my screen. So if you, when you ask to be, um, to speak, if you can just say who you are. Is there anybody else who wants has questions or comments on the application? Mr. Nyland, it's Mr. Riccadelli. Mr. Riccadelli. Um, I, I think, I, you know, I think our understanding the last, I'm just, you know, dragging up my memory from the last hearing. I think our understanding from the last hearing was that we had a condition where this basement was uh, mostly covered. And uh, then we were adding this uh, the, the proposal was to add this addition to the basement level, which would make it mostly not covered. And that was the, the crux of going from two to three stories. It seems uh, like what has been argued and I think makes sense is that uh, that was never really the case. It was our always three stories. And um, as the architect just mentioned, um, ha half of the foundation is already exposed. So that would be counted as a basement, not a cellar by the by the building code, which would mean it was a story. And I, I think that that, um, that logic makes sense to me. Um, and I think, you know, in the in terms of the uh, large addition criteria, I, I wouldn't have any concerns about uh, the appropriateness of, of what's being proposed. Just my two cents. So I, I Mr. And Essie, I think that I probably have just done it again and interrupted you in the middle of your presentation. And I, maybe I should give it back to you and give you a fair chance to say what you wanted to say. Uh, well, <clears throat> uh, I, <laughs> I was going to be arguing uh, uh, a variance, okay, even though I, I knew that uh, I'd have a problem with it, uh, but uh, I was going to be arguing that. And uh, once I got the sense that uh, my concern, as corroborated by yourself and uh, uh, others, uh, that that was not going to fly, uh, and you've got to understand that there historically there have been different makeups on the Zoning Board of Appeals in Arlington. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, the variance. Uh, that uh, I would have been apl applying for and requesting would have been allowed, okay, by the by the zoning board, 
and there were capable people on the board, but I concede that they were not applying the law as the law should be applied, okay? There was a different uh, perspective uh, uh, emanating from the, uh, the board, more from the point of view of uh, trying to uh, make folks comfortable in their homes and keep uh, folks in their homes so they don't wind up selling. And by the way, uh, my clients have two young children, and that's the reason why they want this additional space. Uh, they want the space. They want to remain here. They've been here for years. All their neighbors love them. If you've read the emails, any any five or ten of the emails I've sent, all their neighbors love them, and uh, uh, nobody registered uh, any uh, disdain or any non-support for what they're proposing. So the question, uh, in my mind, as their attorney uh, at, at at this point, and particularly after listening uh, to what you had to say, Mr. Hanlon, last time, is what can I do to try to give these folks uh, the additional space they need so that they can have the space for their children, have an area for the children to play uh, so that uh, everybody's not falling over each other and give them additional living space so they can stay in town. And uh, the, to my mind, uh, when the 48 Oakland Ave uh, case was proposed, uh, uh, not proposed, but uh, suggested that I read it, uh, I, I was kind of encouraged when I read that case. Uh, and I used the word dicta, D-I-C-T-A, uh, for non-lawyers, you may not know what that means, but uh, all of the language in 48 Oakland Ave, uh, even though uh, it was a conforming situation under paragraph A, all of that language that ensued after that, such as the property uh, complying with design standards, R1 zone, not dissimilar to other properties, and not uh, having an adverse uh, effect uh, uh, on surrounding uh, the surrounding neighborhood, all of those facts were uh, not dicta. They were germane to that decision because that decision was decided using subparagraph B. So uh, I'm here uh, trying to bring about a situation where my clients can get relief under subparagraph B, arguing that the they yes, they have a nonconformity, but the nonconformity has existed since 1939, uh, uh, quite frankly. Uh, and when they bought the house, uh, nobody told them that, well, you, you've got three stories here, you've got a problem. Uh, as, and Well, they're actually kind of lucky they have that problem now. Um, yes, yes. Because they have the special position that the law gives to prior nonconforming yes. uses, and that puts them in a better position than if they were conforming. So, exactly. uh, it's, so it's a lucky thing. Yes, so I agree with that. And so that's why I'm here. And I think that's basically what I was going to say uh, uh, before you <laughs> put me on the other path, uh, Mr. Hanlon. All right. So let me, if, if, if there's nothing else for that the board wants to explore it right now, this is a public uh, hearing and, and uh, uh, it would be helpful to give the public a chance to, uh, to speak on the application. Um, and I'm not quite sure who there is uh, who wants to address this, but uh, uh, the general rules for the conduct of a public hearing were read by Mr. Klein. They haven't changed. And uh, so is there anyone here who wishes to address this application? I don't see it. Anyone? Uh, going once. Going twice. Going three times. Okay. Um, so are there any questions and comments from the board? Okay, this is a relative, 
in some ways, this is going to turn out to be a relatively straightforward case, although its route to us hasn't been very straightforward uh, at all. Uh, the legal background is if we define, if we find, and it seems that this is that the existing house is three stories, then this is the extension of a non-conforming use. If it is the extension of a non-conforming use, it's governed by uh, section 8.1.3b of the zoning bylaw. And the standard we're to apply is whether or not the extension is more detrimental to the neighborhood than the current non-conformity. We typically do that by looking at the special uh, permit criteria of section uh, 3.3. Uh, here we have the additional complication that this is probably also a large addition. Uh, that too requires us to look at the uh, requirements of section 3.3, uh, but to be paying a special attention to uh, setbacks and the proximity of structures and uses to other structure, uh, budding structures and uses. Um, at, at this point, uh, we've had a chance to look at where this is. We do know that this has been built behind, is being built behind the uh, structure and away from the street. We saw from the uh, diagrams that were presented to us last time, the elevations, that the building looks more or less like a two-story building from the street, even though from the back, it looks, uh, it, it looks more like a three-story building. Uh, we also know that there's about 50 to 60 feet of uh, rear setback left and then a substantial distance between the property line and the building to the back so that uh, we're not dealing with the kind of proximity to a neighboring uh, property that uh, sometimes becomes important in large uh, in, in large uh, additions. Um, the evidence before us is that uh, many other uh, uh, houses in this area have had similar additions over the years, and that in the end, uh, this will look a great deal like its neighbors, and will be for that reason also uh, consistent with the with the prevailing pattern of the uh, neighborhood. Um, we've also had a certain had a considerable number of people, including the uh, abutter to uh, immediately to the right. If I'm if I got my hands correct, um, that have supported the application, and we haven't heard uh, any, uh, and we have haven't heard any opposition. Uh, I'm saying, if all of those, if the board is willing to find all of those things. It sounds, uh, feels to me as if this is an appropriate uh, case for an approval. But you all are entitled to your own opinion. Is there anyone else who'd like to address this case? Um, all right, going once, twice, three times. All right, seeing none. Um, if we, if the board is inclined to approve the approve the opinion, the uh, case, uh, it would want to impose the three standard conditions that we read into the record before. Um, are there any additional conditions that uh, the board considers appropriate in this case? All right, saying none, the, the chair will accept a, uh, a motion. Mr. Chairman. Mr. DuPont. So this is gonna be a little bit awkward because I, I think I may be adding in um, something that's more along the lines of findings, but, and then we can sort of go to the language of the motion itself. So my understanding is that, first of all, we are accepting um, for the record that this is a three family structure, a three-story structure, the existing structure. And that as a result of that, that we are going to apply um, section 8.1.3b as an extension of a non-conforming structure. And um, so that we need to therefore make the requisite finding that it is not more detrimental, the extension itself is not more detrimental um, to the neighborhood. And in addition, we are also finding that this is a large addition as defined by 5.2, I'm sorry, 5.4.2 B6, 
and that since it is greater than 750 square feet and it's not entirely within the foundation, that we are um, also going to make the finding that it meets the criteria set forth in um, section B6 with regard to harmony with the neighborhood and all of that. So, right. so I don't know where that goes, but I think the motion I, I would uh, move that the uh, application of the uh, owners of 14 Oakland Avenue be approved under both 8.1.3 B as well as 5.4.2 B6 subject to the three standard conditions. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Ricardelli. Is there any discussion? Okay, uh, it's time then for a roll call vote. Uh, all in favor of the motion made by Mr. DuPont and seconded by Mr. Ricardelli. Um, we'll start with Mr. DuPont. Aye. Uh, Mr. Holy. Aye. Mr. Ricardelli. Aye. Mr. LeBlanc. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Have I left somebody out again? I don't nope. think I have okay. this time. I, um, all right. So the the motion carries, and for sure we'll be making the the findings that that Mr. Dupont indicated, and that I was trying to describe a basis for. All right, Mr. Inessi, you've you've done good work for your clients, and it's time. Please, it's you've done me a service by pointing me in the correct direction, Mr. Hamlin. I appreciate. Great, okay, welcome. I think Thank all of you too, because that was a very long process. I appreciate all your listening and viewing and all of that stuff. Thank you. Good luck. Thank Good luck. You. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we're now ready to do the exciting things in the evening, and that's to move to uh, administrative matters. And I need to find them. Um, so the first one is to, you've, you've received, there are two written decisions that are outstanding from our June 27th meeting. Uh, one is the decision for 60 High Heath Road, and the other is for 61 Ariel Street. Uh, so let's do those next. Um, you've received a, a decision written by me. Uh, it's laid on the table for a while. I have I got a few comments and have changed them, have, have done that and have redistributed it this afternoon. Um, does anyone have any further comments or changes that need to be made to that decision? Okay, so the chair would entertain a motion to approve the decision as, as submitted. Mr. Chairman, so moved. Mr. DuPont, is there a second? Second. If that was Mr. Ricardelli. Yes. Uh, um, we'll go do the. We'll call the roll. Mr. Dupont. Aye. Mr. Holy. Aye. Uh, Mr. Ricardelli. Aye. Uh, Mr. LeBlanc. Aye. And the chair votes aye, and the motion carries, and that decision is approved. Uh, the second decision is for 61 Ariel Street, number 3755. That was uh, done by uh, Mr. DuPont. Uh, I did a couple of ministerial things afterwards to incorporate some, some comments by others and redistributed it to you uh, earlier this afternoon. Uh, does anyone else have anything further to uh, add or questions to raise about that opinion? Okay, seeing none, uh, the chair will entertain a motion to approve it. Mr. Chairman, so moved. Mr. Dupont moves. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Ricardelli, second said. Um, we'll do a roll call vote. Mr. Dupont. Aye. Mr. Holy. Aye. Uh, Mr. LeBlanc. Aye. Mr. Ricardelli? Aye. 
and the chair votes aye. So that, that uh, decision is also approved. We also have before us minutes um, from uh, a number of previous dates um, and uh, the, uh, these were distributed to us by um, Ms. Ralston. I know that there she has received some comments to does the board actually have before it the anything that has been changed uh as a result of comments mr ms Ralston? oops well seeing that is not going to be answered. Um, I'm pretty sure that we, I don't know, a little bit at a loss. I do want to make sure we did receive originally uh, minutes that all had the same title, uh, 411, uh, but those have been essentially redistributed. And I assume that the redistributed versions are, are the up-to-date ones. Um, and is is there anyone who's prepared to uh, move to approve the minutes from January 24th? So moved, Mr. Chairman. All right, moved by Mr. DuPont. Uh, is there a second? Second. Mr. Riccardelli? Mr. LeBlanc. Mr. LeBlanc, your voice, if I'm looking at a piece of paper, your voice is sound very well. <laughs> Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, we'll take the roll call. Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Holy? Aye. Mr. Riccardelli? Aye. Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Those motion, those are approved. Uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes from April 11th, 2023? Mr. Chairman, so moved. So moved by Mr. DuPont. Uh, is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Holy. Thank you for getting into the act. <laughs> um, the we'll call the roll. Uh, the uh, Mr. Dupont, aye. Mr. Holy, aye. Mr. Riccardelli, aye. Mr. LeBlanc, aye. And the chair votes aye. Uh, the next move minutes are dated uh, April twenty fifth, twenty twenty three, and I'm going to be really brave and join that with a motion to approve 20, uh, June 27th, uh, uh, 2023, uh, subject to if anyone wants me to take a separate vote on each one. Uh, but the chair will entertain a motion to approve both of them. So moved, Mr. Chair. Mr. DuPont moves. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Holy. Um, We'll call the roll. Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Holy? Aye. Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. Uh, Mr. Riccardelli? Aye. And the chair votes aye, uh, and that motion carries. So that gets us through all of the minutes, um, and I have the feeling that Colleen was doing what I was doing and taking getting away from the screen a little bit, but uh, she now has done that. I just for the record would like to compliment the way in which she's done the, the minutes because they, I think they've they are just the right length they are picking up just the level of detail that you need to in order to have the minutes and and not have them either too long that uh like a decision would be or 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 too short so uh I'm very happy that uh and and congratulate her for strike striking the happy um uh, the happy medium here um, at this point, I'd like to remind the board uh, of our upcoming uh, schedule. We have, as you know, the special, and I'm going to have to do this by memory because I've now lost the sheet that 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 Christian gave me that tells tells me when everything is. So on April on August first, we will be dealing with the uh, comprehensive permit in uh, the Ten Sunnyside case. Uh, that will be. Uh, essentially our opportunity to clear up whatever loose ends there are. Uh, we're getting near the end and the decision, the next meeting after that will be primarily focused on, uh, on the, uh, on a draft decision by Mr. Haverty, 
uh, where we'll be paying attention to the language of conditions and so forth and making sure that uh, everybody understands what the conditions are that are in play and the both the applicant and the public have an opportunity to comment on those things. If everything goes according to plan, we will close the public hearing uh, on August 15th, at which point we have 40 days, which takes us to approximately September 20th to actually decide the case. Um, and we're going to do ex exactly what every sensible person would do when faced up with a daunting deadline like that. We're going to take a two week vacation from this case and uh, and think about it. Meanwhile, however, on October, on August 29th, we will have a regular hearing. I think that we have roughly three cases currently scheduled for that uh, for that evening. Um, and then when we get into September, we have a uh, regular hearing scheduled for the 12th. We do not at this point have the deliberation sessions uh, for 10 Sunnyside scheduled yet. Um, but as you can tell from my just indicating when the 40 days are up, we have to do that early on. Um, the Tuesdays would be the that are available potentially are the 6th, which is, I believe it's the 6th, it's the Tuesday immediately after Labor Day. Um, and then there's a Tuesday that's two weeks after that, that I think that we have no regular hearing on uh, that we may need. We, we don't really know how long it will take. Uh, to uh, to decide to, to to do the deliberations, I would say that it shouldn't take more than one day. But on the other hand, if even if it took only two days, it would be a record for us. Um, and so we probably need to uh, reserve at least two days to make sure that we get the case decided within the time limit that's appropriate. Uh, so check your calendars. If there's a problem with either the 6th or, or whatever that day is, I think Mr. LeBlanc signaled that it was maybe the 5th, but uh, whatever that Tuesday is and the and the Tuesday two weeks later would be the, the dates that we probably should be looking at for uh, to finish our work on, on 10 Sunnyside. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, it, it's been a pleasure being with you all tonight. Uh, and uh, I'm, and uh, we spent a little bit more time per case than I would have hoped. But on the other hand, there were some interesting wrinkles in both of these cases. So we'll see you again on the first. Again, you may want to look at your notes and anything that, that you sort of once thought and that hasn't, to your satisfaction, been addressed. Uh, you may want to see, you may want to be willing to or interested in raising them. Uh, on the first, it's, uh, and also I guess I should say that, Sean, you've all got a copy of Tetratex uh, papers that produces a large number of comments, some of which uh, we have we, the applicant, will be addressing orally. Uh, they will also be submitting a paper that will, with that will address all of these things. And um, so, <clears throat> that will be a focus of the hearing, but this is our last chance really uh, to hear um, our last chance to hear uh, uh, to 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 go sort of free for all and make sure that we've that we don't have any things that when we get to deliberation, we wish we'd brought up and then we forgot. Uh, so with all that, that gives us another week to really enjoy ourselves. Uh, going up to our elbows in the minutia of 10 Sunnyside Avenue. Mr. Chair. Mr. Moore. Quick question. I had had a meeting down for the August 8th. That is not the case. I must have that wrong. I do not believe there's a meeting on the 8th, no. Okay. I probably have that one. Oh, also, while I have the floor, I, I would like to get in touch with you about that first case tonight, about what you had to say and what I was saying. But that's not nothing to do with the official record. It has to do <laughs> feel free. Discovery upon a case being raised with the media. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So there's more the chair will indicate will uh, accept a motion to adjourn. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Moved by Mr. Dupont. Seconded by Mr. Moore. Not really. Uh, Somebody second. else has to do it. Second. second. To Mr. Holy, uh, go through the roll. Mr. Riccardelli. Aye. Mr. LeBlanc. Aye. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Uh, Mr. Holy. Aye. And the chair votes aye. 
uh, the motion succeeds. I, I will say that it would have been more aesthetic is if each of you, when you voted I, had just exited then, so that we would then have something that looks like in an old time movie when you get to the last thing. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Bye.